Um, Eye of the World does a very good job of this. Um, if you read the opening scenes of Eye of the World, we first get Dragon Mount, which in uh, the prologue, instead of some big, long discourse on the history of the world, we have a powerful scene with a lot of emotion, something huge has just changed, and we have a character who's going through a lot of grief, and it's just very, very compelling. Then we switch to Rand, and we have it's not very long. It's probably shorter than you think it is. A lot of readers assume, they're like, oh yeah, I remember beginning the Eye of the World. We hang out with Rand for 10 chapters or so, really getting to know the world, and then stuff goes wrong. Read it again. It's one chapter, and then everything goes wrong. And on the first page, I think it is, or the second page, he sees the mirror draw chasing him. First Page first scene, at the very least, we introduce a mirror, uh, mirror draw. So we introduce a character and a problem first page. Um, it might be second page, but it you know, depends on your version. Thing. It's right there, though. It's not ten chapters of let's get to know the two rivers. It is we introduce Rand as an interesting character who is like us in a lot of ways, and then we put him into conflict, and very soon he's in situations, he has you know, abilities and things that we want to have, while at the same time recognizing ourselves in them, and it goes much faster than you think it does. All right? So, give us a compelling character to start, and then dole out our, our world building piece by piece. Um, these are some tricks to help you do your description. In description, I'm blanketing under description also your world building, how to, how to, how to get across your real world building, how to, not necessarily how to do it, but how to get it to the reader. So another thing to avoid, um, just to, so you can be familiar with it, is something called Maiden Butler Dialogue. Um, this comes from old stage plays, where they would, in order to get the, the audience up to speed, would have the maid and the butler step out before the play started, and the maid would start talking and say, as you know, the master's been away for three weeks. And the butler says, yes, I do know that. And as you know, the, you know, the, the lady of the house has been practicing her pottery while he's been away. Oh, and as you know, she's made a big mess of the pottery. I don't know, you know, stuff like that. We're introducing our conflict by having two characters who would never really actually have a conversation about this, have a conversation about this. Um, watch out for this. Because what happens is if you start putting words in the characters' mouths just to voice them for the reader, you will start to lose the sympathy <coughs> because your character starts to act like a sock puppet. It just starts to act like the, the, um, the, the author saying, you need to know all this stuff. And it's just really another way of info dumping, but without, um, without, uh, without info dumping. The better way to do this... The better way to do this is to start interspersing it with character moments in a, in a strong viewpoint. We'll talk about viewpoint in a second. Um, intersperse this with character moments. Dialogue is always a good way to start. Don't make it made in Butler. Dialogue is a great way because it act actively has, a, um, has motion. There are two people talking, particularly if they disagree about something. They don't have to have an argument, but disagreeing about something can help. So you can have a line of dialogue and then have a response. And then you can work in a short paragraph, two sentences, that may be even attached to this paragraph, that gives a little bit of explanation to what they're talking about. We're introducing one world element. You know, this is a, this is a world where we have exploding gerbils, and our two main characters are ger gerbil tamers. Um, and one is talking about the time where he lost his hand in, in his first day to the, in the exploding gerbil farm. Um, <laughs> Why, why, I, I'm doing this to be, you know, this is funny, but if you actually think about it, if we, if we turn it instead into dragon um, tamers and what is talking about the day he lost his hand, you can have a new <coughs> dragon tamer come on, and this guy says, you know, you can start it with, um, you see this stump? This is because I was stupid. <laughs> and you start your scene that way, suddenly you've introduced an interesting concept without info dumping us, and you have the new dragon chamber start talking about, you know, oh, what did you do, and how can I make sure I still have ten fingers after, you know, this is my first day on the job. And then you give a line of description where he looks and sees a dragon, and you give us a description. You can slip in one line of world building there. We see what the dragon looks like, 
we slip in one line of, you know, he had always wanted to be a dragon tamer because dragon tamers someday became, got to become dragon knights if they never lost any fingers. That was the test. Um, you know, you can, you can slip in that one sentence. Give us one sentence and then go back to the dialogue. And have, have, you know, have old Stumpy be telling us about, you know, about that mean old dragon that we've still got over there that, you know, has, you know, that, that ate his fingers and, you know, be slipping in a line here or a line there. Um, that is how you want to do your, your description in most places. That doesn't mean you won't have to dump, info dump. Eventually, you're probably going to have to. You're going to have to hit these points where you're going to have three or four paragraphs on the, on the history of the world. But... If you've grounded us with your character first, then when you get into those things, the reader's going to be interested because they will already know that our main character wants to become a dragon knight because they've already learned you know, who, what, who this character is, what makes, them, um, what makes them exciting as a person, and they also know, that, you know that their father was eaten by an evil dragon knight, and so we are into this conflict, and we will care then about the history of the kingdom because it will tell us how it relates to our main character who wants to, you know, go get revenge on, on the dragon that, you know, ate his father or whatever. Um, or the exploding gerbils. Um, someone's got to write that exploding gerbil story. Let's talk about something um, that, I did last, um, that I did last year that relates to this um, very specifically. Um, let's get into the nitty gritty details of description. Now, that that I've been talking about is, um, is info dumping. It is a little bit diff different from the concept of description. Um, with description, what we are doing is we are evoking the world around the characters by the things that they sense, all right? A few rules of thumb about description. Number one, your, the amount of description and the type of description you do should match the book that you're writing, okay? Um, description kind of, uh, kind of falls on this sort of this continuum where we have, we have, um, we have kind of the, the, uh, the, I'm not, I've never written this out before, so I don't know if this is going to even make sense, but, um, versus, excitement versus immersion. Um, the more description you do, the more immersive your story can, will become, assuming it's good description. The less description you do, the faster the pacing is going to be. So it's probably not excitement, it's probably pacing. Pacing versus immersion. Um, you will notice that if you read books that, um, that fall into the thriller category, um, or um, a lot of, if you read the books that are meant to be read in one sitting, they're very, very sparse on description. Um, I write epic fantasy. Epic fantasies are not meant to be read in one sitting. Um, if you do, then bless you, but it's going to take you, you know, 10 hours or more, depending on how quickly you read. You, if you read Wheel of Time books in one sitting, then, um, wow. Uh, you know, I mean, this is, we do something different. What a thriller tries to do is you pick up, you read page one, and then you just rip through, and by the end, you're like, uh, are exhausted, and you're like, oh, I can't believe I just, oh, how, what time is it? That's a great thriller. With a, um, and then you are done with it, and you put it away, and you move on. With a big, a great immersive book, you read a chapter, and what your response to that chapter when you put it down is, wow, it all felt so real. I feel like I know those characters. I'm in love with this world and these people. That is the response on the immersion side that we're looking for. Because of that, you actually see the form of the book be change. A lot of thrillers will, and this is kind of a tangent, but you know, a lot of thriller type things have the hook at the end of each chapter. All right? Dan Brown does this. It drives me nuts. Um, go read a Dan Brown book. The chapters are like a page and a half long. And every one of them ends with someone opening a, opening a door and seeing something terrifying and not telling you what it is. And then the next chapter, you realize it wasn't really all that terrifying. But then they open another door, and that one's really terrifying. Um, and they do this over and over. It's kind of the, it's kind of the thriller dirty trick, is to kill you into the next, sentence, next chapter by having quick, short bursts of chapters and something going wrong or getting revealed almost at the end of every chapter. Um, that is what pulls you through. They don't clutter it with a lot of description. And like I said, you get done with it, you put it down. This is why we do not have, they don't have conventions dedicated to Dirt Pit 
in the same way they have conventions dedicated to the Wheel of Time. Because you read a thriller, you generally put it down, you're like, okay, I'm, that's, I'm done with that. It, it's not about the immersive experience, it's about something different. A epic fantasy story, I've realized, is um, generally I avoid, you can do, you know, there, there are fantasy authors who do it differently. Generally, I avoid big hooks at the end of chapters. Generally. You'll find a few of them in every book where we're getting to a climax or where something really important is happening and I want to pull you through to another chapter. Generally, I shoot for long chapters with a nice arc of their own that almost work like a mini short story. Um, there will often be a short denouement at the end which will introduce you into a new concept of what's going to be in the next chapter, but I'm not, you know, grabbing you by your tonsils and yanking you into that next chapter. I'm sort of inviting you into the next chapter by opening a door and saying, we're going to talk about this now. You probably want to be interested in this. Um, but you can always, at the end of those chapters, you'll be done and it will be a, wow, I just had this wonderful experience. That's what I'm shooting for with these chapters. And you'll use different different um, styles of storytelling for different chapters, but just keep that in mind. So, more description you do, more immersion you have. Um, you want to make your description good, however. Um, the good description is going to do um, a couple of things. Number one, it's not going to info dump, but number two, it's going to be concrete. Concrete description should be, um, you know, this is one of <coughs> these things that we really, you really should try and practice. Let's go do something, let's do something called the Pyramid of Abstraction. I did this last year, right? You guys remember the Pyramid of Abstraction? Um, if you were here last year, um, then stay quiet when I ask for audience participation. All right. The idea is with the Pyramid of Abstraction that we, um, you've kind of seen this thing. It's actually, it's Pyramid of Abstraction is kind of like the food pyramid. What was the concept of the food pyramid? Someone tell me. Yes, eat more of the base, eat a bunch of this stuff, so that this stuff that you really like, you know, you don't eat as much, but you stay healthy by eating a lot of this and eating a little of this. Um, pyramid of abstraction works the same way. The idea is that down here you have concrete, concrete language that grounds us in a scene and in a character and what's happening so that when you have all of this elevated stuff up here, which would be the abstractions. When you have abstractions, abstract language, you are not kicking someone out of the story or letting them forget about what's going on. If you really ground them well, this will enhance the experience a lot. It will give you the ability to talk about some of these more abstract concepts. You know, when you start, when the character starts musing about, you know, philosophy or about love or even about the history of the world, those are abstract sorts of things. Whereas concrete sorts of things, if you establish that we're in a scene, establish what's going on in the character and what's happening, when they start to think about these things, you will stay in that character's head and you will pay attention to it as it relates to the character. And instead of drifting off yourself or putting the book down, you will stay in the world. So, the idea is to keep most of your description concrete to earn your abstractions. All right? Let's put some things on this board then. Where does love go on, on the pyramid of abstraction? Abstraction. Abstraction. Up here. Okay. Where would a dog be on the pyramid of abstraction? Concrete. Concrete, huh? Um, when I say a dog, how many different types of dogs do people in this room imagine? Is a dog, so when I say a dog, each of you think of a different thing. Is a dog a concrete concept? A dog is an abstract concept. Not as abstract as love, but it's still a very abstract concept. Dog is up here, okay? It might be, it might be more like right here, all right? That's the problem with a lot of new writers' description. And I talked, I just mentioned this briefly in the editor panel before, um, is that they think that if they mention the dog, that they are grounding us concretely. Well, for a thriller, maybe, because a thriller is not going to go off on the nature of love. You can say in something where you're trying to keep your description quick, you can say just a couple of things and set up the scene so that they can imagine what's going on. But in some, the type of writing we're doing, type of writing that Robert Jordan does, sorry Steve, um, type of writing that Robert Jordan does, epic fantasy, most fantasy and science fiction, 
Because the very nature of our genre is so abstract, different world, different laws of physics, weird science, new, new concepts, we need to be extra careful and stay down here.